Hello friends, I'm no therapist, but I'm your host, Stephanie Goodman. I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a woman of faith. Often friends ask me how I have a successful marriage while blending families and staying optimistic in life. This podcast features people with real life stories about success in relationships and triumph over trial. Are you seeking a more meaningful connection with your loved ones? My return guests, Kathy and Jeff Teichert, from Love and Later Years, are sitting down with Kels and I to talk about three steps to deepening our relationships. Welcome back for another edition of I'm No Therapist, but today I'm excited to reintroduce to you my return guests and dear friends, Kathy and Jeff Teichert. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. And of course, we have my husband, Kels Goodman. I just, I, it's like I can't get enough. So I love <laughs> being here, especially with my wife. This is a rare opportunity for us all to be able to be here together and to be able to talk about things that we've experienced in, in order to give opportunity for others that maybe are going through a situation where they are single and they're wanting to have a relationship in their life or you're married and you're wanting to deepen your relationship with your current spouse. Yeah. So... I would like to dive into this with an acronym that we have come up with, Kathy and I, and it's called AVA. AVA stands for Authenticity, Vulnerability, and Accountability. So in diving into this, authenticity, okay, when we are living in an authenticity state of mind, uh, we are living in a vulnerable or in we're living with integrity. Yes. Uh, I do think there's some relation between vulnerability and authenticity, like we talked about, but they are distinctly different. And we're starting with authenticity because that starts inside of us. Uh, Being authentic and living in integrity with who we want to be and who we are by nature helps other people to know us more clearly. Mm -hmm. I love the definition of integrity being also that it's who you are when nobody else is watching. Yeah, and then whether people are there to see or not, we're showing up very similarly. The the word integrity, interestingly enough, comes from the same root as the word integrated. Hmm. And so integrity is integrating the values that you espouse and believe in into your total life. I love that. Yeah, that's I love, awesome. I love when you break a word down that you've been using for so many years and all of a sudden you understand the real meat of it. Thank you for sharing that, Jeff. So integrity. Kels, what does integrity mean to you? Well, integrity, it's, it's kind of like what you said. It means when you're not being seen and you're actually having to operate, what is your normal operations? You know, what do you do without anybody seeing what you're doing? And, uh, and if you can be integral, the integrity of, let's say as a kid, you know, a lot of times as a parent, you'd want to look at a kid and you go, what is he doing? So you peer in his bedroom mm-hmm. without him looking. Yeah. And uh, and if he's doing something that you're like pleased with, you're like, wow, it's ingrained in him. It's it's in his DNA, yeah. you know. And then if you see him doing something he shouldn't, that's the part where you're like, oh, typical kid. You know, gotta it's work just, on it stronger. it's got to work on it better. <laughs> he obviously doesn't get it, but... Yeah, but even adults, even adults. I mean, we we have to be able to have it in, wired in us to, to do what's right. Is it so. integrated into our character, or is it something external that's motivating us? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. exactly. Well, and sometimes people are motivated externally when they're dating to show up inauthentically so that they'll be liked, so they'll be accepted. 
And one of the worst things that can happen is to be successful at being someone you're not because mm. you cannot keep up with that. Yeah. There's, it, oh. That's just going to be exhausting and eventually you're going to be known. That's a huge temptation if you really like somebody or if you're really invested in a particular relationship. Um, and I've had coaching clients who talk to me about this. Well, I just kind of become who I think the other person wants me to be uh, instead of really being true to who they are. And, and like Kathy said, even if you succeed, you fail because you're going to set up a relationship that you can't really be yourself in. Well, and you can never know if they accept you for who you are if you're not being who you are. Oh, that is so deep. Right. I mean, the fact that you show up inauthentically because you want someone to like you and then if they fall in love with that person they fall in love with a mask with you yeah yeah and if there's anything you withhold intentionally and there's always this secret in the back of your mind that you think oh well if they knew they wouldn't have accepted me i really duped them into marrying me i mean if you think that for years and years and years in a marriage and who knows, maybe some of our listeners might be there in that situation. That's really tough. It's tough to be in a, a situation where you don't really know if you'd be truly accepted for mm -hmm. all of you. I mean, that's a super paradox, I think, because <laughs> <laughs> we're trying, you know, we try. I think we all have a tendency to do that. We try to be what the other person wants us to be, to be liked. But then we don't really feel like we are liked or loved or whatever because they're loving the mask we're wearing rather than who the real person is. Yeah. You know, we actually made a video on LilyTube, our YouTube channel, called Dating Chameleons. Dating Chameleons. Dating, Dating, Dating Chameleons. Chameleons. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, so we addressed this topic on there yeah. because it is a, a phenomenon that's fairly common. Yeah. And when we show up and, you know, try to impress the other rather than just be who we are. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing that was really powerful for us in dating was that <clears throat> when we showed up, we were not always at our best. You know, when you're dating, a lot of the times you dress up nicely, you show up in your perfect hair, perfect suit, and you act very properly, right? <laughs> so how do you get to know each other authentically if you're always in that dating state of mind yeah trying to show up perfect right yeah because in that way you're not seeing somebody um you know in their natural state being able to sit around solve a problem get sick you know how are they when when they're paying their bills you know whatever it is you know because then it's like oh and i think we were lucky because we actually both of us got sick during our dating dating I want to say years, but it's more like days, <laughs> days weeks, months, <laughs> the, moments, the few hours. moments that we actually dated, you know, before we, we said could say I do. Our, da our dating season. That's right. Our dating season, we just, we ended up being, uh, oh, I don't know. We, we ended up just, I think I got a toothache. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. Yes. And then, and then uh, you got, I think you got I had an anxiety too. attack. Yeah, you had an anxiety yeah. attack. And it was just, but it ma it was almost kind of like, oh, this is the real you, you know. That's awesome. I yeah. can handle this. You know, this, so. <laughs> this reminds me of a fireside I was at once. I think Kathy knows what I'm about to say, but uh, the, the guy was speaking about, you know, how to avoid the book, how to avoid marrying a jerk. Oh, but yeah. Somewhere in this fireside, he... he brought up as an example that that tv show the bachelor mm -hmm. where one guy's dating you know 30 women or whatever and he gradually narrows it down to the one he wants to explore things with uh -huh. and he said and they take you to all these exotic tropical locations and he pauses for a second and says i could fall in love with a turtle 
in a location like that. He said, what they should really do is put them together in a room and make them fold laundry for 10 hours. <laughs> yes! That is that so, is so that's good. right. There you go. That Because that's real life. That's when you go home and the honeymoon's over. And that's when the real test is. So. I mean, it's it's funny, but Kels and I were talking off mic. We each had a brief second marriage and they were both long distance relationships. And so the courtship was one big vacation. Yeah, that's you know? all it was. Yeah. It was just one vacation after another. Mm-hmm. And that was probably the mis- one of the mistakes, probably. <laughs> Right. Yeah, because I mean, you know, you go to New Orleans and you're listening yeah. to great jazz music and eating Cajun food and it's so romantic and fun. And it was, I mean, it was a total blast, yeah. but uh, well, is that well, where see, that's what was interesting is from? that is that I took my second ex to New Orleans also <laughs> while we were dating. So that was kind of ironic that we <laughs> right. we had such similar second uh, <laughs> second wife story, so you know, and I'd actually just like to point out that once we are married and we have all of that reality set in, mm-hmm. if we could fall in love with a turtle in a tropical location and we've maybe lost some of that spark, that's where we want to go and be in that <laughs> tropical location with our spouse who we see all that reality with right. and all that authentic real life stuff. The right. And, oh, yeah. you know, dress up and be, you know. Like kind of like we were before. And that's being intentional. Yes. And and it doesn't mean we're inauthentic. I don't think it's ever a good idea to do that, but to, you know, create that that spark again Mm -hmm. with that, you know, those those nice things um, that uh, we, you know, because we know the authentic after we've gotten married and experienced all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I got a question. I wonder when it comes to integrity... I wonder if um, is there a is there a do, do you think there's a fake it till you make it kind of mentality? I mean, like like I said, when you're when you're a child, you you're made to do all these things. So, okay, I'm going to go to church, or okay, I'm going to walk this old lady across the street, or I'm gonna I'm going to do this and that for a while, and then you're doing it even though you don't necessarily believe in it. But you're just doing it in hopes of it becoming a habit mm. or becoming, and then eventually you can ingrained in you. Yeah, it get it gets ingrained to where oh, I do love this person. Oh, I, I am doing this, you know. So I don't know if there's a moment to where you, you know, because I, I remember when I had to go through uh, my first divorce. That's I would almost ask say that going through divorce actually strengthened my testimony in God and Jesus because then I ha- I was pretending it for a while not that I didn't have it but just that that it was just I just was robotically doing everything mm. and then when I saw that my world had to crumble and I had to start changing things now I had to be forced is it going to be wired in me or not are you here or are you not and that I had to make that decision and I made the decision that I'm I'm going to do this and I may not necessarily love this person that I'm serving or whatever, but I'm just going to do it because I want to do it right this time, mm-hmm. you know. And so I don't know if there is a moment or a point in which the the act that you're doing in integrity may have been faked, but through time it's to it's to get you embedded. To you know, The wiring is going on. Well, as you were talking, I thought maybe we could transition fake it till you make it because that sounds insincere. Yeah. To do it till you feel it. Yeah. Oh, so that's a good one. So you do the loving yeah. thing until you feel the love. Because yeah. you're not really faking it if yeah. your goal is to make it. Right. Correct. To be so. you're still and being, become. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're still being intentional if you're trying and not always succeeding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, it's kind of like, like changing a diet or getting off of smoking or something where you're, you know, you're having to retrain your body to evolve from doing something that you shouldn't have been doing to something that you, you now know you need to be doing. Uh, is there a moment there where it may look like you're, you're not really, your integrity isn't really there, but, but you're trying to make it there. Well, and this is um, where you can actually be authentic by saying, hey, you know what? I'm not there yet, but I want to be. 
Yeah. And here's the, here are the things I'm doing so that I can be. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we don't always show up as our best self. And even on dates, whether we're single and we're dating to, you know, get to know people, make mm-hmm. friends, uh, or if we're married and we go out on a date, you know, there's, there's always going to be those days where you just don't feel at your best. And uh, we can be faking it or we could even just be a little vulnerable and honest about the authentic nature of our emotions at that time. Exactly. And I'm so glad that you went into that because our next step is actually vulnerability, which I think is so important that we do show up as a vulnerable person, realizing that we're not perfect, that we have flaws, but the vulnerability that we bring into a relationship can strengthen it. Yeah. It can, and it can also, uh, it can allow people to be endeared to you as you share the imperfections of yourself, you know, cause you can show up and you can kind of flounder kind of in a bad attitude, but like trying to be nice. And usually people can kind of sense there's something off, <laughs> but if you just show up and you say, you know what, I've had a bad day and it's not you. It's like something I experienced and here's what happened. And you know, this is kind of how I'm feeling right now. Mm-hmm. And Um, I'm usually a pretty chipper person or, you know, whatever is true about you, you can say this isn't how I wanted to show up for you today, but, you know, stuff happened and let's, what do you think? Should we try and make the best of it? This is what you get. So, well, and I think vulnerability moves into honesty. How, how honest are you willing to show up in a relationship? Um, I know when you and I first dated that we desired honesty yeah that that was a trigger for us we wanted to have honesty i would say also that we were willing to be vulnerable but you have to take it at certain stages yeah like if i showed up to the first date and i spilled everything (laughs) onto your lap and said here deal with it it's me i'm authentic i'm honest it's who i am it would have scared you away right oh it might have yeah i mean i don't know you are so cute so (laughs) it's hard to tell you know i to to give an example though uh, in another interview we talked about things i told kathy on the first date which included that i was couch surfing at my parents that i'd recently been laid off from my corporate job Mm -hmm. that i had gone through a second divorce it's not a very flattering picture but I wanted her to understand where I was so that if this started going anywhere, she would know. And I want to ask the two of you, yeah. when you heard me tell that story, did you feel closer to me or more distant? Do you have an answer for that? About I the have couch mine. surfing? Yeah, that, that whole thing. Well, I think I, uh, I understood you. Mm-hmm. I, actually, I actually, I think I'd say I felt closer because I understood because I've been there Mm -hmm. maybe not that exact situation but yeah I think I think I would say that I was I understood you I understood it I think when I told those things to Kathy she felt closer to me too and I didn't spill everything about my former marriage and all that stuff but I told her what I felt she needed to know at the time and was honest about it and and so I think that made us closer uh, too. And when you're vulnerable and you're, you know, honest about yourself, I think it invites the other person to do the same thing. And I think that's why vulnerability creates connection. I absolutely agree with that. When Kels was vulnerable about his situation, it was after we had dated for a little bit, we knew that we could trust each other because we had to form a relationship first and then we were able to talk about some pretty deep stuff but the fact that he was vulnerable with me showed me the integrity that he had that he was willing to work through the things that he was going through and I knew that that was a quality that I was looking for in a future spouse was someone that was willing to be honest with me and because they were honest I felt like we could move through anything. So, like you said, the honesty endeared me to him. 
because well, I could see his integrity. Well, and I think from the experiences that we had, we were hungry for honesty. Mm-hmm. So mm. for me, it was just like, here it is, here I am, take it or leave it. You know, something I was thinking as we were preparing for this podcast is that some of our coaching clients, or at least some of mine, have been in positions where they are not quite sure how to navigate after being in the lengthy marriage and then navigating dating, it's really difficult for them to, to be patient with the process of getting to know someone new. Mm. And with this whole vulnerability thing, you know, if we're used to being all in with marriage and all of a sudden we're dating and we don't know this person, we have to use patience and wisdom and waiting to share certain things not because we're being inauthentic, but because we're being uh, judicial about when it's appropriate to share all of that. I really like that you went there, and, and that's similar to what I was talking with with Kells, where we had to make sure that this person that we were with, we were willing to invest in a relationship. And I, I believe that it does take time to reveal all the things we have to reveal and the things we want to work on. But vulnerability is a key factor in relationships. So I want to go into our relationships and marriage. How has vulnerability helped you in keeping your relationship rich? Well, I mean, one thing that leaps to mind is uh, if we're vulnerable with each other, <clears throat> if we don't have secrets, I try to tell Kathy the truth even if I know I'm going to get in trouble. And I think we have to, to be able to do that. Uh, if I lost her trust or she thought I was hiding something or you know, if I had a secret bank account that she didn't know about or you know, anything like that, um, I think it would, it would uh, put up barriers. Mm-hmm. Um, then you start to think more strategically with each other and, and that's, you know, taking you to dark places. So I think it's uh, keeping it real um, with our pillow talks or whatever is, it's really the foundation. Without trust, you're nowhere in a marriage. I totally agree. I don't even, uh, you know, I I think you had mentioned uh, trust in a previous marriage wasn't there and I had that too in my first marriage and I it it was so hard it, it was near impossible mm-hmm. I mean I I even remember thinking where are we if we don't have that right and I think some people may shake their heads and not understand but for anyone who's been there I think they would uh, yeah having trust in the relationship Uh, Like you said, it is really hard when there isn't trust. How do you grow close when there isn't trust? How do you have conversations that bring you close to each other when there is things to be hidden? Well, and this is where the wisdom that needs to come with vulnerability comes into marriage even. If you can't trust your spouse, and you, then you can't be as vulnerable as you otherwise could be. Um, just as when we don't know someone yet, if we haven't gained trust over time with someone, we need to be judicial about what we share with them and how right. vulnerable we are with them, too. Yes. Yes. So when I was in primary, there was a little song that went along the lines of lies. If you tell one lie, it leads to another. If you tell two lies, <laughs> it leads then, oh, brother, basically saying that one little lie adds to another that needs to cover that up, which adds to another, which grows and grows and grows until you can't decipher what the lie was in the beginning. In a relationship, I know that Kels and I, we strive to keep honesty at the highest peak of our relationship. Yeah, I always knew that if there was ever even like one lie, uh, you know, or, or just, or a handful. I knew that, that if there was going to be one or two, that we were going to be on a, you know, a different journey. This was going to be a different situation. Mm-hmm. And uh, not that 
you know, there aren't moments that, you know, I may have, like, eaten something I shouldn't have. Or, you know, I'm on a diet and I sneak it in and, and, and I lie. You know, that's not something that's, that's worth ending our marriage over or okay. saying, oh, my goodness, you're, you're lying. But if it's something heavy... You know, if it's something heavy that that becomes, but even then, if it becomes a little habit, you know, if you're comfortable, that's why I, I try to teach. I've always tried to teach the kids don't get don't get comfortable in lying, mm -hmm. because if you get comfortable in lying, um, then you're going to do it to your spouse. Mm -hmm. And and I think a few times we've scared some of our kids by saying to our to my spouse, you know, that's like. That's so far away. It's like, yeah, but no, you got to practice that now as a kid, because if you if you're gonna lie to me, and get comfortable, and then turn around later and say, oh, that was then and this is now, you know, we've experienced that mm -hmm. where we've had a, a, a kid who later lie, who later told the truth about something, and and then we finally have a talk and say, is that how you're gonna do it to your spouse? Oh no, oh, well. You never know. Yeah. Are you comfortable? So you don't want to get comfortable. So it's that. important to be vulnerable and and honest. Yeah. To to allow that trust to grow. Now we live in a society where we have social media pounding down yeah. our throats constantly, in our eyeballs, whatever it is, it is in our faces, and sometimes. We are faced with some inappropriate images. How do you deal with that in your relationship? Good question. Well, uh, honestly, if, if an inappropriate image comes up, I click out of it. And I never, I never did pornography growing up or anything like that. It's kind of a unicorn. Um, and so Good. I'm not really tempted by it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I... Uh, I have a beautiful flesh and blood wife right next to me. Um, if I if I want to be involved sexually, that's all I want. So, you know, I will tell you that he actually has had a woman send him pictures that were totally inappropriate, and he he shared I showed that it with to me. Her. Yeah, because he, and that's one uh, that's a policy we have that if we hear from former dating partners, you know, and most of the time it's very innocent. It's just mm -hmm. friendly banter, you know, and, and we, we have kept friendships with them. Yeah. We just make sure we tell each other so mm -hmm. that there's nothing, you know, we need to be concerned about. We kind of have that same policy. Yeah, we if do. If we run into something online or something, we quickly show and say, hey, look, isn't that funny? <laughs> and then we move on with our lives, you know, because we have each other. Or yeah. if we've seen something that has affected us, then we are honest with each yeah. other and say, listen, this came up and this is how I felt. And I just want you to know, because we know, we know the value of being honest like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and I feel like you, Jeff. I mean, it's like, that's part of being married is to enjoy the spouse that you have. And, you know, once you, once you... I, I am amazed at the spirituality that comes from uh, being in love with your spouse and not needing to look elsewhere. Mm. It does work. I think maybe sometimes it doesn't for a lot of people, but I've seen it to where, you know, in my first spouse, you know, I was in love with her, but... I admit there were moments where I thought, oh, it'd be nice to be married to somebody else. And that's terrible that I say that. But I'm sure she thought that too. It's authentic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just <laughs> saying it like it is. But uh, but in this case, it's like it's like I, I, I can see now. I see now a better example of what it's like to be in a happy situation and not worrying about looking elsewhere. It's amazing. So. so so here's a really vulnerable comment along those lines. <laughs> um, our, our friend, Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife, talks about in your intimate relationship as a couple, uh, to deepen your connection, you have to be knowable. And mm. people feel very vulnerable when they're in physical intimacy. Mm. 
And uh, it's interesting that in the Bible, the word for sex is to know. True. Adam knew his wife and uh-huh. she conceived and bare a son. Right. And, and I mean, knowing the other person is, um, is literally the word they use for that. And so I, I think about that in terms of you're very exposed, of course, in lovemaking and, and all of that. Um, some people become very shut down in that, in that area as mm-hmm. well. Well, and, you know, they say that uh, foreplay is everything that happens between encounters. And if that's the case, then vulnerability in the relationship, Mm -hmm. being willing to be seen in our daily interactions is what's going to make that so much richer. Right. It extends. Well, in a healthy relationship, that becomes an extension of the love that you share throughout your whole life Mm. together. Yes. Oh, I love that. So rich. So beautiful. You know, I think I just wanted to circle back to authenticity because when you were talking about uh, lie, just starting out one and then two and then three, and then all of a sudden we don't know which is which, Uh I think that's why we started with authenticity because being our authentic self requires us being honest with ourselves first and foremost most and that's what allows us to be honest with others yeah that's right starting from the inside out Mm -hmm. yeah and it's okay to take a daily um check-in inventory inventory thank you yeah it's okay to take a daily inventory where where am i feeling right now how am i showing up in the world how can i better improve myself so that i can show up better in a relationship or to my spouse Mm -hmm. absolutely and trying to be our best self is not inauthentic uh, especially when we're not at our best and we're willing to say it you know and we're willing to be compassionate with ourselves enough to share it and not be ashamed you you know there's a talk quoted in intentional courtship uh, by elder holland but he talks about vulnerability uh, and total vulnerability. And he said, we can't be married, at least in the sense that God intends us to be married, without complete vulnerability. And he said, the good sense of the world would suggest that we hold back a little bit, that we not be so exposed. Mm. And he said, did Christ, as he entered Gethsemane, basically, did he hold back? You know, or was he completely vulnerable? And he also made the point, and this isn't in the book, but I think it's an important thing. He said, now, I don't know all the buttons to push with my wife that would upset her or whatever, but I know most of them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he said, if I push those to gain an advantage in an argument or whatever. If, if, I, if I find myself pushing those, that is enough for the Lord to damn my miserable soul to hell. <laughs> and, I mean, it's kind of a dramatic way to say it, but I do believe that when your spouse particularly is vulnerable with you and when you understand where those buttons are, okay, now you have a sacred trust. Yes. Yeah. And if you start pressing those buttons, and it's tempting, you know, in the heat of the moment to do that. Sure. But if you start doing that, if you give in to that, well, that's going to put up walls that are going to be hard to to break down again. You know, and I would say it's a stewardship. It's a stewardship we have when someone chooses to be vulnerable with us, especially our spouse. But even in the dating world, when we might maybe have dated someone long enough that we think we could share something vulnerable, if if someone shares something with us or we share someone, something with others, we would want them to be sensitive. And, you know, I have experienced a few times where I shared and they weren't, and that hurt. It really mm-hmm. hurt. So I think whenever we're vulnerable, we want uh, to, to be received with sensitivity and we should do the same for others and that's I think that's a sacred trust a sacred responsibility even a stewardship that we can have in this life that when people are vulnerable 
to to show that a lot of respect. Right. And when you are vulnerable, a lot of the times you feel that you can share your biggest hopes and dreams. And the person that you're sharing that with, you would certainly hope that they would appreciate and allow you to have that. Uh, that's something that I remember being drawn to Kells when we were dating was that he shared his biggest hopes and dreams with me. And yeah. I had the stewardship, like you said, to to hold that in a sacred space. Mm-hmm. And I could have used those vulnerable dreams to really hurt Kells when, when things were not going right and vice versa. You you held a sacred space for me to be able to share my biggest hopes and dreams and you didn't pull me apart for it. Yeah, well, there was no sense to because it's like, you're my wife. I mean, I'm in love with you. So it's like, why why would I want to tear you apart? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, we, as we've talked in other podcasts, I have a, a bad habit of tearing myself apart, you know, which I'm, which I'm working on, but but to hurt you, that would be that would be the last thing I'd want to do. So you know, I think this might be a good transition to our third, which is accountability. And of course, you wouldn't in those moments when you feel that love for your spouse, which is most of the time. But what about when you've lost it? What about when your heart rate is a hundred miles an oh, hour? Kathy, and you're I never lose flooded? it. I never lose. I don't know what you're and talking about. And I don't mean about. you. I mean all of us, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that is so with accountability. This is where we take a hundred percent responsibility for our own emotional well-being, for our own happiness, and for our own sense of calm and peace. And um, something that I don't know if we've mentioned this in a previous podcast with you but I think it's worth mentioning here that a hundred percent of problems when they're trying to be solved when a per, one or both people's heart rate is over a hundred beats, beats per, minute. per minute now this is even if you're exercising believe it or not yeah wow. exercising or even just emotionally flooded if your heartbeat has risen you have zero chance of working it out hmm. Wow. And is this because you're in a fight, flight, or freeze exactly. mentality? Yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's our, our physical bodies have put us in that state. And I don't know if you've ever witnessed this or experienced it, but if you're in the middle of that state of mind and you're trying to work something out because you just really want to work it out, or maybe the other person really wants to work it out and you just don't even know how to deal with that, yeah. how long does it go? hours it can we could do it all night if we i mean we have it in us to do that <laughs> well, we yeah. don't but... you're stubborn enough that yeah well yeah jeff and i are very strong-willed mm-hmm. um you know that's something we consider it a lot in our our dating is do i want to be with someone who mellows me out or do i want to be with another strong-willed person we ultimately chose each other and um and that required us making some agreements with each other about how we were going to do emotional flooding. Uh. I'll tell you a story about this very briefly. After I wrote the letter to her where I proposed that we date for marriage, it wasn't very long, but she came to, uh, to my city to go to a funeral of a friend of mine. And we uh, stayed up late that night talking. And the subject of some issues surrounding when we had broken up uh, previously were coming to the surface and we were sharing our pain with each other and it got a little tense a few times that night. And uh, Kathy, when she could see that happening, would say, okay, Jeff, we need to stop or we need to kneel down and pray. Mm-hmm. And so we did, we probably said five prayers together that night and it would always shift things Uh to where, okay, we're putting the relationship first again, instead of trying to make our points to each other. And it it would calm things down. Mm -hmm. And I remember at that moment, that was when I became thoroughly convinced that this is who I wanted to marry. Wow. I feel that. That's pretty amazing. (laughs) 
Do you remember when we were at a place when we were dating that there was conflict? Mm -hmm. And I know my MO (laughs) is to shut down. Yeah. Uh, My first experience in marriage was I was left alone in silent treatment for about two, three days. That's abusive. Oh, yeah. That's, That's hard. So that's what I was used to. And also for me... My silentness is to be able to gather my thoughts because my brain is going a thousand miles an hour and I know that where I am, what I'm going to say out loud will be hurtful and I do not want to hurt you in any way. So I'm trying to work things out internally before I express it. This is where my, my quietness comes from. But when we were going through a conflict, you wouldn't, you wouldn't let me go and sulk. You pursued me in a way that, that you helped me to understand that you were trying to understand that you needed me to communicate with you what was going on. And I remember that being such a shift for me that somebody was teaching me a healthy way of dealing with conflict. Yeah, because I don't like those things dragging very long, you know. (laughs) I mean, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't go for two or three days just leaving you alone and just living my life or whatever. There's, I, that's just difficult for me Mm -hmm. because, because of how joint at the hip we are, Mm -hmm. you know. I just, I couldn't see being that being a, a, a way of living. You know, you know what? It doesn't have to be all one way or the yeah. other. Mm-hmm. And we actually came up with a happy medium, which is we can take a time out when either of us need one. Meaning when we know we're going to say something we'll regret, when we know we're incapable, like 100% incapable of solving anything. Okay. Um, why do the harm? Why do the damage? Why mm-hmm. spend the hours of time, you know, making things worse? But to, to clarify, this is different from the silent treatment. It is not to punish the other person or hold them over the fire or anything like that. It's really to give ourselves a chance to self-soothe, to get calm so that we can have a better discussion. And typically, I mean, for us, typically 20 minutes is enough. Yeah, well, it sounds if we like catch it early enough. Yeah, it sounds like it's a pre-approved... Mm-hmm. Method. Agreement. Point, yeah, agreement that you're doing. It's not something to shame the other person, but it's right. actually, which is what was probably happening before, it was more to shame you, it not was to, to punish. Yeah, it was to punish you. Uh-huh. Whereas this is something where you agree, you know, there's it's a, a button. policy. Yeah. yeah, there's a button. We used to, we in fact, in one of our, that last <laughs> podcast we did in Houston, we. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that we our said. Our raw. Yeah, our raw. Episode. Episode when we were still in the heat of what, we're stuck in Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use the, the ex- end of the world. That's end of the world, we- yeah. <laughs> uh, we we use the example of uh, the Hulk. That that if that if I were getting mm-hmm. ready to turn into the Hulk, mm-hmm. you can't sit there and say, hey, you know. I, I, Let's settle down. Let's breathe. Let's don't, breathe. D- don't mind me while I turn into the Hulk. You know, David Banner <laughs> never does that. Yeah. He's always in the heat of, you know, and it's just, and that's what you get. And, and you know, David Banner's going to turn into the Hulk. He's going to do some damage and then he's going to turn back and then he'll be fine. And, and you hope not to do that damage, but you hope to at least have a sign I'm about to hulk out right now, so give me a moment. Let me hulk out, and then I'll come back to Earth. And and you know, the only damage I was really doing was to myself. It wasn't you know to anyone in particular. And that's the thing I have to work through. You know that we're we've talked about. And uh, so but, I think that your idea of having a timeout, I would say, is similar to having a pre-planned fire escape route. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's actually like putting Hulk in a, a Hulk-proof room. A cushion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no damage to you. There's Going no damage boing, boing, to boing, boing. Yeah. The, the, you know, the, the coupleship. There's, you know, there's safety in that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think this is where the accountability comes in. The I need to care to my emotional well-being right now. 
Yeah. Before so, I can be here to discuss this with you. And there, there's two two other points about that. Okay, we taught our kids growing up, I think you guys probably have too, that decide now what you're going to do if you're offered drugs so that when you're under the peer pressure and the heat of the moment, you don't have to be thinking through it because you don't think well in situations like that. Okay. And whatever it is, whether it's drugs or sex or alcohol or whatever, we tell our kids, be ready with the answer so that it's automatic and you know what you're going to say. Well, we as adults have to do that too when it comes to governing our emotions. We need to decide in advance this is what we're going to do when one of us is flooded and then the procedure kicks in when that happens so that you don't have to sit because if you think well we'll just cross that bridge when we come to it mm -hmm. well prepare for a hot mess um, because that's that's where that's going to land you the one other point uh when you go away to self-soothe during a timeout don't prepare your rebuttal Oh. Don't don't spend that time stewing and trying to come up with all the reasons why your partner's wrong. Focus on yourself and your own emotions. We have a, sh a measure that short of a timeout, if we catch it early enough so that we're starting to talk faster and talk over each other a little bit, either one of us can say, slow down. And when we do that, we're both supposed to take a breath and take turns. Now, that isn't always going to solve it if you've gotten too far into being emotional. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if it's if you catch it early enough, sometimes that prevents you from the inconvenience of a timeout. Yes, I agree with that. You know, and there's safety in taking timeouts and having your partner support you in taking timeouts. Because, you know, I think we talked about this before, when you make this arrangement for yourself, that I, hey, I'm going to be responsible for my emotional well-being, but let's say your partner doesn't allow that. Maybe they're just chomping at the bit to get this resolved, and they want it resolved whether you're ready to do it or not. And, you know, that can even happen between us if, you know, one of us is anxious to resolve it and that's the other me. one isn't ready to talk yet. <laughs> that's her. <laughs> Usually, yes. Yeah. Yeah, We're not pointing too. fingers here. <laughs> yeah, I'd love it to be done. Well, yeah. most of the time it works well for us, but that's the, the place where we can get hung up. But it's like, but after a good night's sleep or after, you know, an hour to myself or 20 minutes or whatever, I promise you will get better results. I promise. <laughs> anyway, but if you if you have a partner that literally will not give you your time out, I mean, I that's how my second marriage was. I would request a time out when I knew I was not an emotional place to be able to handle mm -hmm. the turmoil, the the trauma, traumatic conversation happening, and he wouldn't do it. And ultimately, I mean, that's partly why um, that marriage had to end because it it just it didn't feel safe. So I think there needs to be some mutual caretaking in allowing each person to be their own emotional well-being uh, advocate. Mm -hmm. And I had the absolute opposite extreme with my first wife. Um, we never fought. I mean, we ended up divorced, but we never fought. And people say, how could that be? Well, the... The, the reason I think why I'm sometimes sensitive to I want to get this solved, I want to talk about it and get it over with, is she would, wouldn't talk. She would stonewall me infinitely. And so um, the answer to, okay, when are you going to be ready to talk? Well, never, you know, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. And, and so we couldn't talk about anything hard. And so I have that sensitivity. Kathy has the opposite sensitivity to mm -hmm. someone... Don't push me not to talk when I'm them. not ready. That's not cool. Uh -huh. And so yeah. wow. that's, not, that's not a huge deal breaker issue because we've figured out how to manage it. Mm -hmm. But think about couples that try to deal with, I mean, everybody's got situ, you know, dynamics like that in their relationship. And the people that try to deal with those without any tools, without any skills, 
it's it's no wonder that 50 percent of the marriages end in divorce mm. and then those percentages go up with subsequent marriages and something we like to say is well you know no we don't have a 67 percent failure rate on our third marriage we've got a 27 percent success rate and we're going to be in that 27 <laughs> percent or you know i mean i don't even know if that statistic is accurate but it's somewhere around there mm -hmm. and um but the point is is we believe that with intention and that's why we wrote intentional courtship and in the future we'll write an other intentional books that with intention we can beat the odds we can be in that success rate with intention and this is one of the things we feel very strongly about needs to be the intention of every marriage where we let's stop having those fights when we have zero chance of solving them do uh, we govern our relationship with intention or emotion yeah oh yeah. Yeah. intention will get us there emotion if we govern it with unbridled emotion it's just going to be a hot mess yeah and I think this is one way I mean besides honesty and trust which is fundamental uh, and it, it wasn't like the big focus of today other than being authentic which is you know that and, and having integrity I guess it was really yeah um, honesty through being authentic and real and, and integritous uh, besides that I think managing our emotions and doing it with skill and being able to uh, take this responsibility for ourselves um, seriously and be able to support one another in it I think this is what divorce proofs marriages hmm. that's a yeah. good point that's yeah. a very good point I think no. the, the, the thing that balances that a little bit is um, and I should say this by saying, you know, I, I read Dr. Greg Bear's book, Real Love, when I was going through my divorce. Mm -hmm. And I fought with it about three-fourths of the way through. Interesting. Uh, and the reason was he basically said, you have to honor your partner's agency all the time, every minute, even if you don't agree with what they're doing or think that it's unwise. And his... his I was thinking, well, what do you mean? I, I can't demand that my partner do anything. Didn't she make covenants? Didn't she promise to love me? Didn't she promise? To, you mean she doesn't even have to talk to me if I'm hurting? You know, how, how can that be right? I fought with it like that all the way through. And it finally dawned on me as I probably read it from him several times in the book. Um, love not freely given is not real. And so if I have to manipulate, force, coerce, uh, what I'm getting for that is imitation love, not real love. And deep down, I know that. There's and, a lot of anxiety in that grasping. And yeah. I realized that my first marriage was based on an exchange of imitation love. Uh, and when the exchange wasn't to one of our advantages, the other one was always unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so I think... When we talk about accountability, it's not really about holding our spouse accountable. Yeah. We don't really have the right to do that. We can hold ourselves accountable. Correct. Oh, absolutely. This accountability thing is all about self-accountability. And you know, one thing, um, so we interviewed Jennifer Finlayson Fife on Lilypod. Okay. It was an amazing interview. I mean, she really, so she's a... She's a Latter-day Saint sex therapist. Very oh, popular yes. one. Yeah. Okay. And uh, she gave a lot of really good counsel and wisdom in it. And uh, the thing that she said about, okay, well, what's the one quality that everyone should look for when they're, they're looking for a partner? And she said, you know, someone who's willing to see themselves. Someone self-reflective, I think, is the terminology she used. Yeah, someone who's willing to be self-reflective and... I think even self-improving is, is, is what she said. And I think this comes back to the accountability. You know, when, when we're accountable for ourselves, we are taking that inventory. Like you said, mm -hmm. Stephanie, we're, we're taking inventory and we're willing to work on ourselves. And that's why personal development is such a big part of the book we wrote, Intentional Courtship, um, because it is really, in essence, the only way in which we prepare to be with or in a healthy relationship is to be more healed 
to be more whole when we enter that relationship. And if we've loved and lost, if we've grieved a loss of a, a previous partner, yeah. then that's the work that we have to be accountable to do for ourselves. This I mean, is true. Two happy people don't get together and have a lousy time. Yeah. yeah. Normally, right. a marriage is unhappy because one or both of the partners is kind of chronically unhappy. Well, and marriages themselves aren't either happy or unhappy. It's, right. it's just two people that either are or are not. Yeah. Well, I've always thought that, like, when I met and dated Stephanie, falling in love with her was easy. Mm. You know? Yeah, there's all the logistics that you have to do of being able to... Uh, you know, where are we going to live and how are things going to happen? But the love for her was easy. Mm. That was, there was, there's been no, you know, oh, I guess I need to alter my life to love her here or I need to see what I can get her to do here. It was more, hey, I just want to hang out with her. Right. And, and that's why when, when I feel like singles come to me and always say, you know, uh, you know, how do I know if I'm going to, you know, how do I know if they're the one or, or, you know, they overthink. I feel like this is me. Everybody does things obviously differently. But I feel like if you're overthinking it, then maybe there's a problem. Maybe there's some red flags there. Because I feel like if you're overthinking this, do I love them? Is it real? Is it, you know, I mean, you got to have time to learn. You got to have time to figure out. But, but if it's something... That, you don't want that to seep into once you're into marriage, you're still doing that. You don't, you want to, it has to be natural. This is my girl. This is the way we're going to do it. And we'll figure it out. We'll figure out all the details later, but I love her and that's what matters. And as long as it works, then, you know, we're here and uh, Chewy's excited to be here too. So, <laughs> but anyway, what else you got here, Stephanie? What else is on your... Well, you know, earlier. one thing that I wanted to address is uh, before I was divorced, I used to listen to a radio show called, um, it was by Dr. Laura Schlesinger. And I used to listen to that oh, too, yeah. right? Dr. Laura. Yeah. I, I saw myself calling her up and talking about my situation many times, but I never did. However, there was an audio book that I really enjoyed, and that is Dr. Schlesinger's proper care and feeding of husbands. Mm. Now, there are some points that Dr. Schlesinger goes over that I don't exactly agree with. But one thing that I kept in mind from that audiobook was when I was dating, I knew if I was getting together with this hot guy, I made sure <laughs> I made sure to look cool. my best. I made sure to think about what what we were going to do on our date, how I was going to act. I knew that I was excited for the date. I knew that um, maybe there was going to be a kiss at the end. Like I was excited about these things. I showered. I I put on my favorite perfume. I just showed up as someone that I wanted him to be attracted to. And when we get married we can fall into the slump of not really caring about how we look by not taking inventory of how we're showing up. How many times are we wearing yoga pants <laughs> in a week? Why are they going to work and seeing women that are all put together and then coming home to, to someone that has been in bed most of the day? Or, or just whatever you can do to, to keep that that love alive that shows through your actions that there's a purpose that I'm in love with you and there's a purpose why you're in love with me. You know, there was a lady that I dated um, after Kathy and I had broken up um, and she was a great person. Uh, she had lost her husband under some tragic circumstances, uh, but, but fun to talk to. She had a dry sense of humor that I enjoyed. Um, I, I mean, there were a lot of things I liked about her, but when she showed up to our first date, she was in dirty jeans that were blown out at the knees. You know, she was in a cardigan that had holes in it. Um, 
And she, her hair looked like it hadn't been washed in a long time. Well, I I looked past all that for a while because mm-hmm. um, maybe she had a bad day. I don't know. Yeah. And she's, she seemed great. I mean, she was great. Um, but I, I came to expect that this was was the way she showed up on the de- on a date and in life. And I had something come up where uh, my great grandmother w- was a prominent artist, and there was a dinner at the BYU Art Museum that they did for our family. It was sort of a highbrow kind of event, a dress up kind of event. Okay. I wanted a dinner partner, and I thought about inviting this woman that I was dating, Mm -hmm. and I thought she wouldn't fit in, and so I didn't, uh, even though we weren't dating anymore, we were friends, and I asked Kathy to come as my dinner partner because I knew she would dress nice and, you know, do well in, in that setting, and maybe that's shallow of me, but I... You know, I, I know man looketh on the outward appearance and the Lord looketh on the heart, but none of us are dating God. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm not suggesting people be inauthentic, but I think it does say something about you if you always show up to life looking unkempt. Yeah. Yeah, and I do agree with you that when it comes to marriage, uh, that isn't the time to stop caring. <laughs> um, and not just for your partner, but for yourself. Absolutely. You know, and we used, we, I think we originally had said that self-love was going to be one of our three uh-huh. and accountability essentially is self-love through the responsibility to care for yourself. Absolutely. And so I think being, um, uh, being willing to to take care of ourselves, uh, you know, proper grooming and all that, mm-hmm. you know, I think, you know, it, it helps us feel better, puts us in a higher vibrational state of mind. We end up positively impacting those around us, I think, when we take the time to do that. Yes. And I know sometimes when Kels is in a place where he's really not liking himself and I'll see him beat up on himself, I... I go into a place of, you know, that's my boyfriend you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Talk about way about the man I love. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) And I think that if we take that accountability into ourselves of, of how, how we love ourselves and how we want to show up in that relationship, I think that those are tools that, that deepen our relationship. So really quickly, I just want to go back over those. the um, acronym. Ava. Ava, correct. <laughs> Ava, do you have Ava in your life? Instead of Moxie, it's Ava. <laughs> do you have Ava in your life? Authenticity, vulnerability, and accountability. Now, we're no therapists, but we do have real life experience, and we would love to be able to hear from you. What are some what are some uh, values that you feel have enriched your life in relationship? And uh, also, I would like you to reach out to my friends, Kathy and Jeff Tykert. They have a website, and I'd love for them to introduce a little of their information. This is their beautiful book behind me that they have mentioned, Intentional Courtship. This is a mid-singles guide to peace, progress, and pairing up the church in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's right, and that's the first one sold. That's Isn't right. That the first yeah. one sold. So. Stephanie found out that it was uh, it was live before we did, and we got that <laughs> message right. from you. I was like, right. awesome!" <laughs> I so had no idea that this was the story today. Just, just <laughs> yes, I have so. I have the authentic, hand autographed book of the tigers and it's selling well on amazon so so this is the book that we wish we had when we were dating it's the book we wish we'd had when we were dating (laughs) well and that's one of the reasons we wrote it is we felt like the mid-singles community was underserved Mm -hmm. in in the church so you know and we wrote it the summer of 2020 
right after COVID hit the U.S., we, oh. uh, it kind of became our, became our COVID project. I mean, that really wasn't the intention. It was more that just happened to coincide with the timing, which helped because, you know, we were able to knock it out in about four months. We wrote that whole thing. Oh, my wow. goodness. It just came pouring out of us. Um, and we were very intensely focused on that project. Um, but then it took us over a year to perfect and polish it, you know, where we had three professional editors, we had beta readers that we applied their suggestions. We had a final proofreader, you uh-huh. know, and then the uh, f- formatting, of course, we we're very particular and picky about, <laughs> so, um, anyway, it took us a while to get it out. Um, it came out in November of 2021. And in the meantime, we we uh, developed an organization called Love in Later Years, and yes. um, our website is loveinlateryears.com. That's a good way to find all of our stuff. Um, through Love in Later Years, we created because the acronym for that is Lily, and so we created Lily Pod. Uh, two words: Lily Pod is our podcast. Lily Tube is our our YouTube channel. Lily Publishing is how we're uh, publishing our <laughs> books, and um, also Lily Coaching. We went and um, got certified in life coaching so we could be more skilled, um, along with our mutual university degrees in family and human development. Mm. Uh, we both happened to have picked that same degree when we were going to school before we ever met. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, yeah, we'll just invite everyone to, to go to our website and um, subscribe to our Lily letter. Uh, we send one each week to our feel, subscribers. Feel free to email us at loveinlateryears uh, at gmail.com. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok. LinkedIn, you know, all the, all the places, all the goods, all the goods. So if you're not reaching out to Jeff and Kathy Teichert, it is your own fault. (laughs) (laughs) They're a, they're a fun couple with a riot full of stories. So it's awesome. And they are being authentic and vulnerable and accountable. Well, our book is pretty vulnerable, Uh, honestly, more vulnerable than I am probably comfortable with. (laughs) But one thing that we hear from a lot of people who have read it is, it's nice to know I'm not alone, Mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing, that Mm -hmm. it feels kind of like, wow, this is somebody who understands. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. And I would say, too, that, you know, having you in my home has been such a treat, because I can feel your spirit. I can feel that you are authentic about wanting to reach out and let others know that they are not alone that they have options and and your willingness to share your vulnerable stories i believe are a powerful tool for connection Um, i know that we all have friends and we all have our own personal stories our own trials and through tools like these we can triumph through those trials Mm -hmm. And be transformed into who we are really meant to be. And that transformation can come a lot more easily and readily to those with tools. And that's why we're trying to uh, create and share those tools. If you've enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe, share, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram. Please comment because I would love to hear about what you think and what you want to see in the future. I'm no therapist, but I am your host, Stephanie Goodman.